This is the fourth message on repairers of the breach. Um, and I'm giving you some practical keys in how we can determine what happens in our lives and not be dictated by the past or the conditions that are placed on our lives from our forefathers. Um, there is liberty in Christ and that liberty and freedom comes from knowing the truth. I've shared with you and I said to you the word of God is the truth. So your liberty is hidden in the truth which is the word of God. Um, and this is the word of God that I'm sharing with you that can bring you to a place called freedom. Amen. Bible says that we are more than conquerors. Now when we look at the more than conquerors concept, it means that they are people who are conquerors. But then they are people who are more than conquerors. It's a position in Christ. They are those who are warriors and they want to remain warriors. The expression of Christ is being a warrior and they want to remain. They don't transition from that place of warfare into a place of peace. Are you with me? I'm fine with the warriors. Maybe they're grace to war all the years of their lives and all the days of their lives. But I want to transition from that place of being a warrior to a place called being a conqueror. And then be from place from being conqueror into a place called more than conqueror. So I'm fine with the battles that I face. But I'm not God's mighty warrior. I don't want to be God's mighty warrior. Because the Bible says that they are, we are more than conquerors. As if there is a place positioning called more than conquerors. It means that those who are warriors and then those who are conquerors. And they can remain conqueror. But it does not guarantee they can remain in peace. Because you can conquer something. Yet still be alerted and be attacked by the enemy. Are you with me? So being a victorious or being a conqueror does not guarantee you peace in a particular area of your life. But when Bible says that we are more than conqueror, it means that we have transitioned from being in the battlefield and being warriors into a place called being conquerors. And now we transition from being conquerors to a place called more than conquerors. It means that we have found peace. Are you with me? Are you with me? We not only conquer, we establish the peace of God in our lives. So we're no longer just warriors and we're long, no longer just conquerors. We are more than conquerors. We are not intimidated by the enemy that may come up. Come, come to us and intimidate us. We have moved away from being warriors to conquerors to our place called more than conquerors. We are at peace. Are you with me? We are at peace with who we are. We are at peace with what God has done. We are at peace where we come from. And we are not making any kind of excuses to linger in that place of defeat. For some time for cheap attention. Because we have transitioned from that place. We are now in a place called more than conqueror. I will highly recommend that you listen to the other three messages. As we move forward in this series of repairs of the breach. We learn that there are ancient runes that God trusts us to do. And rebuild and reestablish and demolish as well. The different kinds of ancient runes that come into our lineage. I shared with you from last week. There are, I think two weeks, we, we had a gap of roughly two weeks. That there is a freedom that you have access to in Christ. And Bible says he has brought us into his marvelous light. And that's the freedom we have. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. But I also shared with you, if there are still struggles in your life, it means that there is a extent of freedom that you still need to have access to you you can have access to freedom but may still be not 
fully liberated in your mind. And we went on learning about the lives of Israelites. They were out of Egypt but still remained bondage, remained in bondage to that spirit of slavery in their minds. Are you with me? I want to highlight this one thing that I shared and then we move today forward. I'm giving you some practical keys and I said to you, it's the light of God that illuminates certain areas of your life. And one of the things that the word of God will illuminate in your life is the conviction. You measure, you start to measure your life by the word of God. And you start to see things differently and you, you start to examine your life by the word of God. And I said to you, how you identify a stronghold in your life is when you lose the conviction about certain things. There are certain things in your life that you do so naturally you don't feel bad about it. Those are strongholds. I shared with you that the absence or the lack of conviction is the absence of Holy Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit that convicts your heart towards sin. So if you do not feel convicted by certain things, if you don't find remorse in your heart when you do certain things or certain behaviors and attitudes and sin in your life, it means there's an absence of Holy Spirit and that's a very dangerous place to be. If you lack conviction towards your wrongdoing, it's a dangerous place to be. I also want to highlight the other thing that we pounded quite a bit on the second message in this series. Where I said to you, sin has made a house in a particular place. There's a sin that makes house in a particular area of your life. And sin does not just come in. It starts to build a house in there. Which we learned that demons call this place, the soul of man, the house. I will go back to my house where I came from. You remember that? I won't go into the detail of that thing. But I said to you that if demons keep coming back or the enemy continue to use that particular area of your life to rob you of your peace and satisfaction and fulfillment in life it means there is a house that has been built in that area and that's why enemy has free access in and out are you with me and I said to you some of these houses we build with our own, you know, sinful nature and character and habitual sins and behaviors. But then there are houses that are generationally built in our lineage. Are you with me? I'm just doing a recap of some of these things. And these generational bondages often we struggle with. They come so naturally to us, we don't even feel we have a problem. Everybody else, we like, oh... You know, they will be just avoiding you and you feel that you're right and everyone else is wrong. Amen. These things come naturally to us. Why? Because there's a prayer, absence of the Holy Spirit in that particular area of your life. And there's an other spirit that is governing your life. And there is an absence of conviction. So you'll be rude to people, but you won't have any guilt, remorse or bad feeling about it because that's how you are. That's a stronghold. Because it lacks conviction. How, you, how do you identify a stronghold? Where you lack conviction. Tell your neighbor where you lack conviction. That's a stronghold. You will do certain things. You're addicted to certain things. Habitual sin. And you keep going back and back. And you have no remorse it, about it. Even though you come to church. That is a stronghold in your life. Because the spirit of God has just removed himself from that area because there's a presence of another spirit in there. That's a house that demons come and go and take advantage of you. Are you with me? The strongholds will fight the word of God concerning those things in your life. So I will be speaking to you about the sexual immorality and sexual purity and teaching you on these things and you will have no conviction about it because you're living in it. So it fights the word of God and this is where people don't want to be in the church because enemy will fight them to not hear the word because the freedom is in the truth and the truth is the word of God. Are you with me? 
So enemy fights those strongholds because he want to possess those houses in each one of our lives where he can have a legal access to come and go and make make us vulnerable to all the, his tactics. So he fights the word because the word of God, like I said to you, is the light ways the hiding of God's power. It's the word that you need to hear. It's the word that will bring liberty to you. It's the word that will bring shift in your mind to say to you, listen, this is wrong. You need to change. There is more to you than what this is. So enemy fights the word. An enemy will keep you blinded from the realities of God. God's word concerning your life. As long as he can put you off about the word, he can continue to live in those strongholds in your life. Are you with me? So there are strongholds that you are currently constructing. How do you construct them? Through habitual sin. I shared with you, this is the year of the altars. You build an altar and you continue to empower it every time you indulge in that sin. That's how the strongholds are built. That's how the high places, spiritual high places are built in the lives of people. Every time you commit that, you're taking literally a, an offering of worship to that altar. You strengthen his presence. You empower it to have more control over your life. Every single time you do that, that's not just an ordinary act. It's an act of worship and surrender to that particular demon in your life. This is where it becomes harder for people to break off these cycles because they are not just ordinary sins or now just ordinary doings. They are, they have over the years become strongholds. And some of us build intentionally these things in our lives to keep the flesh entertained and the other things we just inherited and they just became part of us and we continue to build those altars and those strongholds in our lives. These are generational things sometimes. Amen. And that's why they come so naturally and that's why there's no consciousness about these things. And you feel that you don't feel bad about your attitudes, your actions and your ugliness. I gave you another powerful indicator how God will come to liberate you. I said to you and I'm still recapping, please forgive me if I'm recapping. But I, I feel that you need to understand these things because there's a two weeks of gap between these teachings and now we're moving forward. I just want to connect these things when we move forward. Are you with me? I said to you, one of the powerful things that can happen to you is, or redeeming things that can happen to you is challenges. Because the challenges will bring what's inside of you. So God will allow the challenges to expose these generational strongholds in your life. So you will go through a challenge and now all of you, all of a sudden you feel depressed. All of a sudden you feel to do that certain things because that certain thing is your escape from what's happening in your life. An enemy, enemy will empower that area. You know, hey, listen, you're going through this. It's fine to do this. So challenges expose these strongholds. Are you with me? Challenges, God doesn't allow challenges to come and destroy you. In fact, challenges become, with, from this teaching, what we're learning, the challenges become that redeeming vantage that you can have. All of a sudden, you, you become aware, hey, why I feel angry? Where is this anger coming from? Anger is not of God. How must I deal with this? And the conviction comes and the Lord says, this was already in there. Now it's coming out because what's inside of you is coming out. You replicate, you reproduce what you are and who you are. Are you with me? You will reproduce what's inside of you. That's how everything in the natural was created. You are a natural being. Everything in the natural was created. That's why when God had to look for a partner for Adam, he had to reach out to Adam and pull Eve out of him. Because God had created everything in the natural that it can, it can function and reproduce itself. Are you with me? That's how God has created you. So hard times become those redeeming points in your life, junctions in your life, where God starts to expose you certain things area in, in your area that you're not aware of it. But the enemy becomes even more empowering to 
take advantage of those challenges and pull you away. In fact, strengthen the presence of such altars and strongholds in your life as well. So you've got to be very, very careful. Hallelujah. Are you with me? In fact, I've seen people defend their behaviors. Uh, they, they lack the conviction of certain things and remorse of certain things that they do to themselves and to others. But they, they defend their behaviors. Amen. Let me say this to you. The Lord has set you free. And he, make, he need to make you free. And you don't need to live in those strongholds. You don't need to live under the power and the control of such strongholds. Amen. You, you're not supposed to be what you are. Amen. You must overcome whatever you struggle with. You must overcome whatever you struggle with to make sure it is not transferred to the next generation. Because if you not, that iniquity will be transferred up to the fourth generation. You must overcome that struggle. It doesn't matter it started with you or it's in your lineage. It must stop at you. You must overcome what you struggle with. So it does not go beyond you to the next generation. So the fight is not for your own freedom. The fight is for your children's children and your grandchildren up to fourth generation. So you are in a battlefield, but you're not just fighting for survival. You need to overcome and you need to be more than overcomer and conqueror in order to establish peace. So it does not go beyond you. You must overcome what you struggle with. You with me? Light. The Lord illuminates the darkness. The light comes in. The light comes in through the word of God. That's the first thing I taught you. You must become hungry for the word of God. And some of you have been sending me beautiful messages. How the hunger for the word is increasing in your life like never before. And I'm grateful for the Lord for that. You know what? What's on, you, on me will come on you. I may not be able to transfer you all kind of glitz and glamour and wealth. But what's on me will come on you. There will be increased hunger in this house for the word of God. There will be an increased desire for the purity and holiness in your life. And it will happen. We, the Lord will do this. Are you with me? I cannot promise you prosperity. But I can promise you eternity. Are you with me? One of the principles, other practical thing that you can gain access. Firstly is the word of God. The more you read, the more you illuminate, the more empowered you are once you hear. The faith comes, faith comes by hearing. And hearing what? The not hearing any kind of jargon, but hearing the not hearing the gossip, not hearing any kind of thing, but hearing what the you need faith to survive in this time. And the faith can only come by hearing the word of God. An enemy will deprive you of faith. Why? Because as long as you don't have faith, you cannot move from where you are to where you need to be. So he will deprive you of faith by depriving you of the word. So he will make you busy, make, you, make, you, make your schedule in such a way that you deprive from the preaching of the word. Listening under the, you're sitting under the word of God and listening to the word of God. Because your liberty is in the word. Are you with me? Truth sets us free and sanctify them by your truth. Your word is the truth. Truth is the word of God. Liberty is in it. Are you with me? So the other key that we are going to discuss today is the repentance. Everybody say repentance. Now the word repentance in the biblic Bible literally means the act of changing one's mind. Everybody say mind. This is where we have this series on the warfare, war of reality and I, I, I brought you into the place called the mind, in the battlefield of the mind. So this is where the two series are combined and they are, uh, let, me, let me say this to you, these are impartation services. Don't miss them. 
Are you with me? These are life transforming words. Don't miss them. So hear me today. Repentance is a powerful key to detach yourself from these strongholds. Repentance. Whether they are built within your own life or they are generational. Repentance is one of the most potent keys to deal with such. True biblical repentance go beyond remorse, regret, or feeling bad about one's sin. It's not just you feeling bad about it. It's beyond that. It involves more than merely turning away from sin. This is how the dictionary includes uh, the definition of repentance. In its fullest sense, it is a term for a complete change of orientation involving a judgment upon the past and a deliberate redirection for the future. There is an intentional redirection, change of mind, how things should be done and how things are done. Are you with me? So there is, there is a complete sense, there is a complete change of how you see things and how you judge things. In the Old Testament, repentance or wholehearted turning to God is reoccurring theme throughout the scripture. Throughout the scripture. Repentance was demonstrated through rituals such as fasting, wearing sackcloths, and then you have sitting in ashes, and there's a lament that expresses strong sorrow for sin. I know we have a, you know, Quite a few things in the body of Christ where we fast with the breakthroughs. How about fasting for repentance? Yeah. Let's keep the main things, main things. These rituals were supposed to be accompanied by authentic repentance. All these rituals in the Old Testament we see. There is a remorse, there is guilt, but they got to be the change of heart. Turn your Bibles with me to Job chapter 2 from verse 12 to 13. Bible says in the book of Job chapter 2 verse 12 to 13. Even now this is the Lord's. I'm reading from the translation CSB. Even now this is the Lord's declaration. Turn to me with all your heart. With fasting, weeping and mourning. Tear your hearts, not just your clothes, and return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love, and He relents from sending disaster. So He said, Turn to me with all your heart, not part of it. Part of my heart belongs to my work. Part of heart is consumed with the family. The Lord says, if you are returning to me, if you want to repent and give me, you need to give me all and come with humility, come with fasting, come with weeping and mourning, with remorse. I just don't want remorse. I want a change of heart. He says, tear your hearts. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Fast to mourn the sin, not fasting for a breakthrough. I have come to learn certain things in my lineage. Man, it, 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 it really tore me into pieces. And I wept before God, weeping, Lord, forgive my generation's past. Rather than making them an excuse for me to do even worse what they did. I, it, it was the conviction, it was the spirit of God leading me. You need to go on your knees. I expose you to these things. Are you with me? So fasting to mourn their sin, not fasting for things. Weeping and mourning not because you are treated bad at work and at home and everybody is rejecting you. So what? Weeping and mourning on the condition of your heart. More than on the, on the condition of other people's behavior towards you. It's the condition of your heart that he says, I want your heart and I want it fully unto me. I want you to give me your heart. And then the promise is, he says, if you give me your heart, I give you grace and mercy. Those are the two powerful keys how God liberates us from generational strongholds is he extends grace and he extends mercy. I'm going to give you some practical indicators how to implement mercy over your life. It will liberate you from things. 
No one in the scripture was denied mercy. Whether they knew the God of heaven or not. Whether it was Nineveh, whether it was a centurion, whether it was a blind guy pleading Jesus for mercy, whether he knew God or not. No one was denied ever mercy. Because mercy will cover the areas that you're not even familiar with. So he says, if you give me your heart, I will extend grace. And then he promises, I will give you mercy. Amen. So repentance brings grace and mercy to be extended upon you. Repentance will cause the grace of God to be stretched upon you. Repentance will cause the mercy to cover you areas that you're not familiar with. Things that you don't know that your fathers have done, your forefathers have done, and they, you are the one reaping the fruits of such abominations before God because the iniquity is being visited up to fourth, fifth generation, and you are reaping what they did. You, ex God extends mercy if you come with a repentant heart. He covers that area. That's how powerful repentance is. Are you with me? Jesus, Jesus Christ's mission wants to call sinners to repentance. I'm going to quote scriptures and I'm going to throw it at you. And you just keep it for your reference. Bible says in Luke 5.32, I have not come to call righteous but sinners to repentance. When Jesus started his public ministry, he also called for repentance. Matthew 4.17 records, for the time... For that time on Jesus began to preach. Repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near you. Hallelujah. We're speaking of the kingdom and we think of the abundance and the prosperity and blessings and healings and all that is part of it. But the kingdom of God is initiated with the spiritual principle called repentance. It's the repentance that will cause the kingdom to come on you. Are you with me? This is how Jesus started his ministry. He says, repent for the kingdom of God has come near you. The kingdom of God, the rule of God, the governance of God, the desire of God to be God over you is around you. But in order for that kingdom to come in you, you got to repent. Are you with me? You got to repent. And you got to not repent just part of your heart. You need to repent with the whole of your heart. Jesus says of repentance, I tell you that in the same way. Luke chapter 15 verse 7. There will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Because they can be righteous people who do have a need to repent but deny to repent because they are too puffed up in the self-righteousness Jesus says I rather have one repenting to me than those self-righteous prideful people that think of themselves high and mighty are you with me yes we are children of God but don't let enemy deceive you that is a prideful place to be that is a place that where you are now high and mighty and everybody is below you Repentance. He says there's more rejoicing in heaven. I watch over the 99 righteous that go to church. But I'm rejoicing over the one that has an irrepentant heart. And has a need of me than those who feel that they can conquer the world without me. He calls for absolute surrender. The Bible says in Luke chapter 13 verse 5. But unless you repent you too will all perish. This is what he said to his disciples. Unless you repent, I have called you, I have redeemed you, I have given you my righteousness, you're seated with me, but unless you repent, you too will perish. And this is where many of us will feel that, you know, when we go to heaven and there's going to be a celebration, but the Lord will say, I never knew you. You boastful, righteous, self-centered individual. Who lacked humility. I never knew you. Are you with me? His favorable message. To the disciples. He, he told them. Jesus commanded. That they take his message of repentance. And faith to all nations. Luke chapter 24 verse 47 says. And that repentance and remission. 
repentance and remission of sins should be proclaimed in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. He says, I'm asking you to wait for the Holy Spirit to come, but I'm giving you key to unlock the heaven where the Spirit can come on you and that is repentance and remission of your sins. Are you with me? John the Baptist message was repentance. Bible says he, he decided to declare in Matthew 3, 2 and then you have Mark 1, 5, 15 and Luke 3, 3 and 8 giving reference to John the Baptist. What was his message? Repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near you. You want to desire the kingdom of God where there's an abundance and peace and joy and righteousness but you've got to repent in order for that kingdom to come near you. Are you with me? Mark chapter 6 verse 12, the disciples also went out and preached that people should repent. Bible says this, this preaching and this preaching continued in the book of Acts. Peter preached to Jews. What did he say in Acts chapter 3 verse 19? Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. That the times of refreshing may come from the Lord. He says you seeking refreshing times. Some of you lingering on seasons that are stale. And he says you seeking refreshing. But the refreshing can only be ushered in through repentance. Repent so that the times of refreshing can come. You are in cycles and you are trusting God for a brand new season. But he says repent so the times of refreshing can come. I am giving you key to usher in the presence and the power of God. To make room for God's grace and mercy in your life. And that key is repent so the times of refreshing can come. So your sorrows can be lifted. So the joy can be restored in your life. Repent for the times of refreshing may come from the Lord into your lives. Paul preached to Gentiles in the past. Bible says in, in the book of Acts chapter 17 verse 30. He says in the past God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Later he testified and he says I have declared to both Jews and Greeks. That they may turn to God in repentance. He says you can turn to God for anything, but you can turn to God only with repentance. Some of you, you are declaring things as if God owes you something. That's why the prayers are not answered because they're filled with self, such self-righteous pride and arrogance towards the God of heaven that they cannot be answered. They are an abomination before God. And I believe in declaring and, and decrees. But those declarations and decrees must flow in your life from a place called purity and holiness. Then the spirit of God can unction you to do those, these things. But you live in sin and then you continue to go around and decree and declare things over your life. Heavens remain, will remain shut over you. Because there is a place called repentance. When we turn to God and God must turn to you when he sees repentance. Book of Acts chapter 20 verse 21. Are you still with me? Acts 26 verse 20 says, And first to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, in all Judea, then to Gentiles are preached that they should repent and turn to God. Every time there's a place called turn to God and God turning to people, there is a common fact. And that is repentance. Are you with me? So all these passages I have quoted to you. Repentance is an important part of initial response to the gospel. And repentance must remain part of every believer's life. Amen. Every single day. There's that sense, consciousness of God that must surround you. For everything that you do, how you behave, how you act, how you respond to things must come from that, from that place of humility and surrender unto Him. Amen. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 9, Now I'm happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. Sad place, sad times, sorrow, guilt, remorse towards things must lead you to a, not to the bottle, not to the secular immorality, not to the clubs, 
not to the gossip and backbiting he says the sorrow must lead you to repentance so you can turn your heart towards god and god can turn towards you repentance will cause that to happen hallelujah in revelation this is john 2 Revelation chapter 2 verse 5 this is John speaking the word of Jesus Jesus said to them consider how far you have fallen and then he says repent and do the things that you did at first repent and do the things that you did at first with him with Christ this is the reference where you have lost your first love repent and return to your first love amen are you with me you still love me hallelujah everybody said the word of god i dare not compromise it might lose the audience let it be are you with me i cannot compromise the word there is hell and hell awaits those who are sinners and some of those sinners are Christians in the church and they will spend all their life in the church and still go to hell. And my responsibility as a shepherd is to make sure that none of you will go there. You possess things, but my desire is that your soul will be saved. That you can have an encounter with God in His presence and power. That's what I desire more than anything else in your lives. Because you're in my care. So I see you, I see your lives, I see your attitudes. And I plead before the Father that they, they can be turning from that. So God can extend grace and mercy upon you. Are you with me? Just forgive me. There are two Greek words that are used in the New Testament for repentance. I do not take this lightly. I want you to know this. Your soul matters to me. Because I'm placed shepherd over your soul. The Bible says throughout the New Testament there's two references, two words that are used. That the first one is verb is metamolia, metamolme, metamolme. It's a verb. It means, it's used for repentance, a change of my mind that produces regret or even remorse for wrong done. It's a regret, it's a remorse for things that you have done. But not necessarily a change of heart and action. Are you with me? So there is a word called repentance and it's just change of mind that produces regret and you understand you start to have an understanding now okay this is wrong this is wrong this is wrong but you continue to do it there's that kind of repentance as well you know you are wrong but you don't feel a necessary to change your heart and your actions. You know the gossip is wrong but you still indulge in it. You still entertain it. The very fact that people can reach out to you with stories. Not only reveals their heart but also reveals yours as well. That they can feel liberated or have freedom to gossip with you. It tells me who you are as well. Are you with me? So we find this kind of repentance in the heart of Judas. Matthew 27 verse 3. Again, I'm giving you reference. I'm not asking you to go there for the time's sake. It describes guilt Judas felt over betraying Jesus. But there was no change in his heart towards that condition or that sin that he had committed. In fact, he went and killed himself. He knew he has done wrong. There was that shift in his mind where he acknowledges that he has done wrong. But that was a metamolome kind of repentance. There is a change in how you think and see, but there is no change in your actions. 
Are you with me? But the true biblical repentance is the word used metanoi. Okay, it's a Greek word. It's it means to change one's mind and purpose as the result of after knowledge. So true biblical repentance is categorizing four different elements that we see in this kind of repentance. It's not just change of mind. Okay, I acknowledge and I know this is wrong, yet I still do it because I'm struggling with it. So you have all kind of excuses to indulge with that kind of sin. But the true repentance will be not only the change of your mind, which is a knowledge now you possess that this is wrong, but also change of your heart towards it. You become intentional to bring change in that particular area of your life. Let me run through this quickly for the time's sake. So there's four, four elements that categorize this kind of repentance, the true repentance. True repentance involves a sense of awareness of one's own guilt, full sinfulness and helplessness. Write down this scripture for your reference. Psalm 51 from verse, verse 4 to 10 and Psalm 109 verse 21 to 22. The presence of godly conscience is a first step. It's a good thing that you are conscious in, about that sin in your life now. So Psalm 51 from verse 4 to 10. And then you have Psalm 109 from verse 21 to 22. There is a tremendous remorse, an acknowledgement of that remorse, and there is consciousness and awareness of that sin in David's life. That's the first thing. Then you have true repentance, captures, apprehend, or take hold of God's mercy. It acknowledges that I am helpless. It acknowledges that no matter whatever I do, my righteousness is not enough for God to extend mercy. So he leans, the true repentant heart will lean towards God's mercy. Are you with me? Write down scripture for your reference. Psalm 51 verse 1. Psalm 51 verse 1 and Psalm 130 verse 4. Psalm 51 verse 1, Psalm 130 verse 4. Number three, true repentance means a change of attitude and action regarding sin. Are you with me? True repentance means a change of attitude and action regarding sin. So you're not only aware of it, you're not asking God to give you grace and mercy to deal with that. Here are the steps. You become conscious of it. How does that conscious comes into you? When you become aware of it. What makes it aware? The word of God. I'm speaking to you. The Lord is already convicting you of certain things in your life. You agree with me? That is the light reaching out to you through the word of God. So the word of God comes to you. Makes you aware of this. Hey listen. This is not of me. Get rid of this. So then presence of conviction means the presence of the Holy Spirit and I've told you you must thank God for conviction it means God is already involved in that area of your life lack of, con lack of conviction is a danger zone because it indicates the presence of demons it means someone else governs that area but if you become aware of that sin it means the spirit of God is already involved it means there's conviction because he convicts the heart of man so you must thank God for conviction you're in a good place are you with me the after you true repentance is a way of the sin and aware of the helplessness not spiritually arrogance but helplessness and is reaching out for grace and mercy it does not remain there he said lord i need grace to overcome this i cannot live like this i need grace to overcome this are you with me i need mercy to be extended because no matter whatever i do i still keep continue to go back in this cycle i need mercy are you with me? So it becomes a way that true repentance then changes. It means a change in your attitude and in your action regarding that thing. You are going to do something about it. If you know that certain areas are tempting for you, you don't be there. 
if you know that you if you are alone you're going to get into unnecessary habitual sin and cycles that god may be in at work in delivering you don't be alone if you know that there are certain people if you are in their company you will be encouraged to do certain things and then you will be remorseful afterwards don't go to such companies you are not strong only way you fight temptation is there's one practical key to fight temptation and that is to run away and we learn that from life of joseph you cannot be high and mighty and powerful and spiritual to fight temptation there's only one way to run from temptation and that is to flee from temptation james speaks of it and we know how joseph being a handsome guy overcame temptation what did he do he ran run from it unless you are and let me now even go in there no one is strong just run away from it doesn't mean that now you're fasting and praying and you can overcome and you can be in the company of such people that can easily lure you into things that are not of god run away run away flee 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 be intentional in how you deal with that particular area for it to not be transferred to the next generation you are dealing with it you need to overcome it and i'm giving you practical keys make make an intentional decision that you will be mindful of this particular area i struggle with anger and i need to be mindful that i need not to be angry at stupid things and small things and finding excuse to be angry be aware of it be, have the conscious develop that godly conscious ask god to give you grace and mercy in that particular area and then you work on changing your attitude when you are placed in that situation in the beginning if you can't deal with it run away from it are you with me change your attitude hatred of sin hated you you must hate that sin you must reach a place write down the scriptures where you build this kind of consciousness you become so aware of it and you know it's a stronghold and you hate it with passion psalm 119 verse 128 psalm 119 verse 28 job 42 verse 5 and 6 job 42 verse 5 and 6 second corinthians chapter 7 verse 10 hatred to sin the certain things that i struggle i hate th- those things are you with me i hate those things and i hate those things so you need to build and establish and mature that consciousness within you in order to despise that which you struggle with and unless you despise it and hate it then only you can overcome it are you with me am i helping somebody true repentance results in a radical and persistent pursuit of holy living there is a quest that you are on and that is conformity to Christ i've shared with you the greatest quest in your life must be to be more like jesus not to have better careers and better houses praise god for that all those things will be given to you added unto you but you're not chasing after them are you with me bible says these signs will follow those who believe what does that mean whatever is following you whether it's ugly bad or good is an indicator or is a result card of what you believe are you with me so if there's certain things that are chasing after you they are only chasing after you because what you believe these will follow those that believe they cannot follow unless you believe So if sorrow is chasing after you and you can't redeem yourself from the grip of that spirit change how you believe so it will back off it's only after you are following you because it's following what you believe are you with me So true t- repentance results in a radical and persistent pursuit of holy living so you're intentional about how you live 
you change how you believe and that belief system the word of god helps you to change your your belief system this is changing you how you think are you with me so you listen to the word you 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 meditate on it go back and listen to this message over and over until it gets into you the messages that i have listened to over 50 times because i want you to believe what the preacher was saying some of my own messages i listen to over and over because i preached it but i want to believe that this is what god has for me are you with me because that word the more you listen to it the more it will make room in your mind it will alter how you start to see things and change so it's an effort that you need to be so intentional in your life implementing these certain disciplines are you with me So true repentance results in radical and persistent pursuit of holy living walking with God in obedience to his commandments. And I close with this and we will continue on repentance and I'll be going back to the scripture in dealing with how we break the strongholds of the generations past through repentance. Today we're dealing with how you deal with the stronghold that you are building through sin and enforcing and empowering certain altars in your life next week we'll deal with the repentance and we will deal with the subject how we deal with the sins of our forefathers are you with me so essentially i close with this repentance means to change one's mind about something and they after you change your attitude your actions strengthen the presence of conviction in your life godly consciousness everybody say godly consciousness where you're aware of it at all time you with me i've seen in in this country the intersections are very narrow very close to each other so if you missed one which is going to north and you want to go to north just um you know a couple of meters away there is a one going to south so you will end up on the south on the wrong side it's so easy to lose your directions in this country because they just they just next to each other and then you are literally heading on the opposite side and then the gps will start to say recalculating recalculating you know like but i just took the turn but in order for me to get back on the right direction i have to make sure that i'm very intentional about it otherwise i can just carry on and this gps can scream the, its head off recalculating wrong turn wrong turn wrong turn and you just reduce the volume and you carry on have you done that because it's irritating is is traffic jam and you feel like yeah you know what let me just go somewhere this direction today but you're in the wrong direction it doesn't matter you irritated by it you're tired by it you are you know frustrated with all that is happening around you you are still on the wrong direction and unless you change the lane find the next lane to get back on the right track then only you will reach your destination which you were intending to go that is repentance you're not only aware of it but you're changing your direction away from it you are intentional about this establishing certain disciplines in your life so this does not become a stronghold because if it becomes a stronghold then this is going to be dealt with up to fourth fifth generation so you're not only doing harm to yourself by entertaining that sin that demon whatever it is you are bringing a whole lot of calamity on your sons and your grandchildren and your generations to come that's how serious these things are so you inherited strongholds and altars and high places but you might be building one as well without you even knowing about it repent how to get away from it repent turn away be cognizant of it build a godly conscious and be intentional to not feed and empower that altar are you with me
Did I help you today? Would you please stand on your feet?